this video, we're going to start looking at data transformations. So we've spent a lot of time looking at how to visualize data, but often to visualize data, you, know, you need the data in a certain format. Maybe you only want to look at a particular variable, or you only want to look at one variable when a different variable takes certain values. And so in order to do this, really what you need to be able to do is to manipulate the variables and manipulate the data to get into a format that makes it easier to work with. So that's what we're going to look at in this video. So you'll notice up here I've got the module 7 one script open. Now one thing that I think I've mentioned before, but I just want to make sure to mention again, um, a lot of times whenever you start a new script or a new project, you want to make sure that you don't have anything old over here. So you want your environment to be empty and your console to be empty. Now each time you exit R, it gives you the option to save your workspace. I typically always tell it no. I don't want to save that because you don't want to be carrying over old information from the previous times. That's the whole reason we work with scripts. Anything that you had in there before, we can always you know, get back again by rerunning the script. Now, if you've got some old stuff in here that's hanging around, maybe you told R at some point to save your workspace and you want to get rid of it. Sorry if you can hear my dog. Um, so here in the environment, to clear out your environment, you can click on this little broom and it will clear it there. To clear the console, you can click on the broom here, or if you go to edit, there is a clear console option as well. And then if you had any plots, you can also clear them here. And so that will clear them. But remember, if you clear it, you can always get it again because we write everything in these scripts, we already have the code to easily produce that output again. So remember the most important part about what we write really is the scripts because the scripts are what populate everything else. So even if we clear it out, we can always go back to the script and we can get what we need. Previously, when we visualized data, we looked at ggplot2, which was part of that tidyverse. Now we're gonna look at a different piece of the tidyverse and that's what's called the dplyr package. So to use dplyr, you could either call dplyr by itself, or just like when we worked with ggplot, we just called the tidyverse. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pull forward that tidyverse package. We can do that using library. Now if for some reason you're working on another computer or something happened and this sent back an error, remember that you do have to install the package first. So if, you know, again, you're working on another computer, remember to install the package, you can run the line of code to do that, or you can go up to Tools, Install Packages, and choose Tidyverse here. All right, so one thing to always be careful with is if you get any conflict messages, dplyr will overwrite some functions in base R. And so to call the base functions, we saw previously what we could do is we could remove our new package or there's actually another option, and I've got a little note here. So for example, dplyr is going to overwrite the filter function. If you want to call the original one, you can do stats double colon filter. And what this is doing is filter is part of the stats package, which is in base R. So it's calling it directly from that package. And I'll show you another example of this here in just a little bit. Alright, so we're going to need to call in our data. Our data is going to come from the ISLR package. So again, your first thing you're going to need to do is install this package and you can go that by, do that by going to tools, install package, type in ISLR, notice that is all in caps. I already have it on my computer so I'm just going to call it forward. And we're going to look at the car seats data set in this package. Alright, so let's look at the data set. Here we can read a little bit about it. So if we see here, this is a simulated data set containing sales of car, child car seats at 400 different stores. And so if we look down below, we can see some of the different um, variables that are included. So we've got sales, we've got competitor price, income, advertising, population, and so on. So take a moment and look through those variables. And then of course, if we wanted to view it, we could do one of two things. If it had already, we'd already done something with the cars data set, it would be available here. Since we haven't yet, we're going to use the view function. So we'll run this. Notice it's now populated here and we could kind of scroll through and look at our data set. All right. So 
When working with dplyr, there are five different main functions that we are going to look at. They are filter, arrange, select, mutate, and summarize. And we're going to look at these five over the next two weeks. So in this note set, we're just going to start out by looking at the filter function. Now all of these though are going to work in a similar way, so you'll notice the next couple sets of notes are going to start with the same um, comment chunk where we just talk about the dplyr basics and we load in this data set. So the first argument in any of these five functions is going to be the name of the data set. The subsequent arguments are going to describe what you want to do with that data frame or with that data set. And then what's going to result from these functions is always going to be a new data set. So essentially what each of these five functions are going to do is they're going to take your data set, they're going to do something to it, and they're going to produce a new data set. So we're going to start out by looking at the filter function. So the filter function will pick observations by their values. So let's look again at that car seat data set. I've already got it up here. In particular, note these two variables. There's urban and US. So if we go over here to the right, we can see that urban is a factor with levels yes and no to indicate whether the store is in an urban or rural location. And US is a factor with levels no and yes to indicate whether the store is in the US or not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the filter function. I'm going to call the car seats data. And what I want to do is I want to just look at the pieces of the data set that has urban equal to yes and us equal to yes. Now this is going to look similar to when we used the which function before and it is going to do something very similar. This is just another way to achieve the same goal. But notice here in the call I am using some of those logic pieces that we talked about before. Remember previously when we used the which function, if I wanted to find out which elements were equal to a certain value, I had to use the double equal sign. The reason for that is the single equal sign. Remember that is um, our assignment operator. So the logic, the logic version of equal is the double equal sign. So let's run this. So notice what happened. Um, I applied the filter function to car seats. And what it has done is it's going to pull out all the observations that have urban equal to yes and us equal to yes. And down here in the console, it has produced that new data set. Now, I don't really want the new data set to appear down in the console then. Console, and the reason for that is, is I can't do anything with that data set if it's in the console. Really what I need to do is, is I need to assign an object to be equal to that new data set. And that's what I do here in the next line. So notice I've, I'm, I have a new name here. It is car seats underscore urban underscore US. This is going to be the name of my new data set. And I'm going to set it equal to the line of code that I had up above. So running this, notice over here in my data, I have a new data set that has appeared. If we compare it to our original data set, notice we have the same number of variables, but we have fewer observations. So let's view our new data set. So first we're going to come over here to the urban and US variables. Notice if I scroll down, <coughs> both of these are equal to yes for all of these. So what the filter has done is it has taken our original data set, which was the car seats data set, and it has pulled out all of the observations or all of the rows where both urban and US were equal to no. So for example, this line right here, line 43, has urban equal to yes, US equal to no. This line or these observations will not appear in our new data set. Right. So a couple things with the logic arguments, and again, these are the exact same ones that we looked at when we looked at the which function before, so you may want to go and review those. Let's say instead we wanted to pull out urban equal to yes, but us equal to no. Now for this variable, remember that us only takes the values yes and no, so no is the same thing as not yes. By playing Placing the exclamation point in front of the equal sign, this means not equal to. So the exclamation for our logic means not. So if we run this one, again looking at the code, the first one creates the new data set using this piece of the code and assigns it to be this object. 
we see our new data set has appeared up above. And then this line of code views it. So if we pull it here, notice now my data set only has the observations where urban is equal to yes and US is equal to no. Now we can combine logic operators. Up here at the top, we had urban equals to yes and US equals to yes with a comma in between it. The comma in between the arguments here is the same thing as the AND symbol. So notice here in this line of code, I have the exact same thing that I did up in the line above. I am going to call this, put a 2 after the name of this one. The reason for that is, is I don't want to overwrite my original one, so I'm just going to put a 2 so that I know that this is a different one. But really the only thing that I've done different is instead of the comma, I have put the AND sign. So running these, again, we're going to create the data set in the first line. We're going to view it using the second line. Here's my fourth data set that we've created. Notice that urban and US are equal to yes for all of them. Notice it has, if we come over here, 186 observations of 11 variables. That was the same thing we got when we used the comma. So the comma acts as the AND symbol. But maybe instead of AND, we want OR. So the OR is going to be the vertical line here. So this is going to create a new data set where either urban is equal to yes, US is equal to yes, or they are both equal to yes. So running this one, we get yet another data set. And notice as we look through here, if we look at the urban and US, we will find that for each of the observations, at least one of them is yes. In other words, there are going to be no double no's as we move through here. And that's what the OR symbol does. And then finally, the last way that we may want to filter our data set is we might want to have, probably pull out the observations that have the variable or values of a variable in a certain set. So for example, let's look at our education variable. So notice here, um, education is the level at each location. So just to get an idea of the values that education uses, I'm going to use my table function. So here I'm going to table the education variable from the car seats data set. Here is that table. So notice what this tells me. 48 observations had education level 10, 49 had education level 12, all the way up to 40 had education level 18. And remember this is a simulated um, data set. So what exactly, you know, education is representing here, I'm not entirely, you know, that's not entirely clear, but the idea here is just to see how to use this filter function. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use our filter function, but notice after the data set, I have this piece of information. So this is what's called the end function or the end command. So what this is saying is I want it to keep all of the values of education that are in this vector. And we've seen how to create vectors before. And so this is one reason that creating, you know, knowing how to create vectors is useful because here what I'm saying is I only want it to keep observations that have education either equal to 11, 12, or 13. And so let's run this one. So here's our new data set. Here is education. So remember we told to only keep observations with education equal to 11, 12, or 13. And so as we scroll through here, we can see we only have 11, 12, and 13. And if we wanted to double check that, we could use our table function again. But this time I don't want to look at the car seats data set. I want to look at that new one we just created and the education variable. So notice here, we only have values of education equal to 11, 12, and 13. And notice that the counts match exactly what we had in the original data set. So we still have 48 observations with 11, 49 with 12, and 43 with 13. So we can see that we really did just pull out the rows corresponding to these observations. 
And then this last bit here is just kind of a note about missing values. Um, missing values can make comparisons tricky. So recall we talked about earlier how NA represents an unknown value. So almost any observation involving an unknown value will also be unknown. So for example, if we wanted to see if NA was greater than 5, well that's going to tell me that's NA. Is 10 equal to NA? NA. Um, and don't worry about the um, the yellow if that's probably appearing on yours. All R is telling us here is there's a better way to check whether or not something is missing. We're actually going to see that later on. So if you have that yellow, you can just ignore it. We could do NA plus 10. We see that's equal to NA and then NA divided by 2. So these are all examples and your book does a pretty good job talking about the missing values. Um, this next example we're going to look at actually comes from your book and explains what's going on here. So for example, we're going to let the variable x represent Mary's age and we don't know how old she is. Okay, So we set x equal to na. We're going to let y be John's age and again we don't know how old he is so we're going to set that equal to na. And so now we might ask, well, is x equal to y? And so notice we've set both x and y be equal to na, but r tells me as a return na, it doesn't return true, so why is that? Well, and the answer for that is we don't know what Mary's age is, we don't know what John's age is, so there's no way to know if they're actually equal to one another, so that's why even with this logic argument, you are going to get an na. Now the reason we got the yellow up here, you'll notice if I hover over it, it says use is.na to check whether an expression evaluates to na. So again, R is kind of giving me this reminder, there's a better way to check this. And so we actually use what is called the is.na function. So notice up here, we set x to be equal to na. And we can ask R, is x na? And it will return a true. Now this is a really handy thing to use with data sets because we can combine it with the sum function. So let's see what happens here. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually partition out this piece of the code so we can see what it does. I'm going to use the is.na and apply it to the car seat data set. So if I run this, what this is going to do is for every value in my data set, it's going to put a false if it's not in A, it's going to put a true if it is in A. So in other words, a true would represent a missing value. But if you'll notice here, as I scroll through here, you know, this is going to be kind of tedious looking for the trues to see if there's any missing values. And you can imagine if this were a bigger data set, that would be even more difficult. So what we do is we can place this inside of the sum function. R codes all the falses as zeros and the trues as one. So if we add up all of the falses and all of the trues, that's going to give us the number of trues, which would be the number of missing values. So in this case, we get sum is equal to zero because there are no missing values in the car seat data set. Now here I did this for the whole data set, but there's no reason that we couldn't just do this for one of the variables. So for example, we could do it for sales. And again, we're going to get zero because we know that there were no zeros in this data set. All right, so in the next video, we are going to continue looking at dplyr, but that is going to be the end for this one.